Craig was supposed to sing uh, for us this morning, but don't worry, it's, I'm not going to take his place. Uh, his mom is, is pretty sick today, and uh, so we need to remember <clears throat> uh, Virginia in our prayers, and also Craig and, uh, as we pray this morning. So we're going to go to the Lord and pray in just a moment, but I do want to call your attention to our, our, uh, our new Lord's Supper table. Uh, it's also our new baptistry as well. And I know we have several baptisms. I think we have nine baptisms uh, scheduled for as soon as we can. And uh, so in the, in the coming weeks, probably sometime um, at the end of this month, or the first part of August, uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a baptism. So uh, we'll, we'll see all that. And people say, well, how do you do this? And how does it work? And uh, as soon as I find out, I'll let you know. And, uh, but it's all right here. It's all, it's all right here. And uh, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to our, our time of baptism. And, you know, if you would like to be baptized, uh, if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and uh, you would like to make that public profession of faith, and you've never been baptized by immersion, uh, at the end of the service, we offer a time of commitment. And you can come and say, listen, uh, I'd like to be, uh, I've accepted Jesus Christ and I would like to be baptized. And uh, we do not believe that baptism saves us. Uh, salvation comes as we accept uh, Jesus into our heart and into our life. But we also are aware of the fact that the scripture tells us, it's a command, that we are to be baptized. And so there are two commands that we follow as a church. Uh, one of them is baptism, which we do once. And then the other is observe the Lord's Supper, which we do regularly. And so those are the two, we call them ordinances, ordinances, commands uh, by, by Jesus. So anyway, at the end of the service, the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and that's something that you've thought about doing and would like to do, um, there's your opportunity. There, there's your, and there'll be several of of folks being baptized when we, when we do our, our baptism service. So I just wanted to share that with you. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful this morning for the country in which we live. We're thankful, for, Father, for those that have gone before us to uh, allow us to be in this place at this moment. Uh, Father, we're thankful that you have shed your grace upon us. And Father, we may think that we are a worthy people, and we may think that we are uh, a people that uh, should be um, held high, but Lord, we know that we are just people uh, like like everyone else but father you have blessed us and you have placed us in a special place uh, you have put us in this place in this country at this time for this purpose and so father we pray that we would be mindful of your work and mindful of your kingdom and mindful father of your of your desire and that we might um, echo that desire, that we might follow that example, and Father, that we might go forward and be the leaders that you would have us to be. Father, we pray that we would be leaders like Joshua that we talked about in our Sunday school time this morning, and that we would be quick to listen, and Father, that we would find common ground, and that, Father, we would be able to to move ahead and to move forward. And Father, I pray for these moments this morning in the midst of our worship time that, that we would be able to place all other thoughts and all other situations beside us. And Father, that we might be able to focus completely and totally upon you. Father, that we may listen to what you have to say as we are listening now. And Father, that we might respond as you would lead us to respond, that we might not put off to another time or another day, because, Lord, we know that today is the day and that this is the time. 
We thank you, Father, for your great love and for Jesus Christ and for the eternal life that is available through him. In Jesus' name, amen. World War II had ended, and so on September the 2nd, 1945, General Douglas MacArthur on the U.S. battleship Missouri uh, delivers a message to the nation, and he does that in Tokyo Bay. And this is what he says. He says, today the guns are silent. The skies no longer rain death. The seas bear only commerce. Men everywhere walk upright in the sunlight. The entire world is quietly at peace. That long war that MacArthur was talking about cost about 60 million lives and over a trillion dollars. That war came only a generation after what President Woodrow Wilson called the war to end all wars. And even since World War II, we as a nation, we have been engaged in, in Korea, in Vietnam, in Iraq twice, in Afghanistan, and that's not to speak of all of the limited wars that have been going on across our country and, and, and also the political assassinations and the personal revolts and rebellions, the social revolutions, and of course, 9-11. And here we are on this very morning as we celebrate our independence. This very day, we are involved in a war ourselves against Islamic terrorists that seek to destroy Christianity and also to tear away all the vestiges of our Western culture and lifestyle. And so we all understand that the history of the world is a history of war. And we talk about war and we talk about nations and we talk about those people and those leaders. But as we look at our text this morning, it's found in James, in James chapter 4. As we look at this, as we look at this passage of scripture today, we see that, that James kind of brings it closer. Uh, it's not so much what governments do that cause war, what leaders do that cause war, or conflicts that arise that lead to war. But James brings it closer to home when he makes it clear that our personal stories, the stories that we have, the, the history that we have, they too are war stories as well. In fact, James asks the question, he says, what causes, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire that battles within you? And what a very penetrating question that, that James asked. Uh, he's asking, you know, why can't we get along? Uh, why is it that we at times rub each other the wrong way? So if you have your, your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to James chapter 4. And we're going to look at this passage, uh, verses 1 through 10. And, and what we're going to find as, as we open up and as we, we look at this this word for just a little bit, what we're going to find is we're going to find the origins of, of our conflicted relationships. We're going to find out where they come from. And also we're going to find out what we can do about it. So it's really a, a two-part understanding here. So let's read in James chapter 4 beginning in verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? 
And therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God? Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. And that's why the Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So James makes it very clear in these few verses that the person who is in conflict is not only in conflict with someone else, and really when we are in conflict with people, we see, we see that that's the reason why we are in conflict with them, because, because of them. But James also makes it clear that we are not only in conflict with others, but we're also in conflict with ourselves. And he even goes on to say that really the source of conflict is our conflict that we have with the Lord. And so he reveals the source of our conflicts and then he doesn't end there. He, he tells us and gives us an antidote to all of that. So that if we use this antidote continually, it, it helps to... Um, keep us from having these conflicts and it also helps us to bring other conflicts that we already have to a satisfactory conclusion. So let's begin and, and let's take a look at this origin of our conflicts. He first of all says that when we have conflict that, that we are at war with each other. And that's easy for us to understand. I, we understand that. Conflict, the other person. Uh, we know the tension that it brings. And, and we can almost hear the sigh of the psalmist. In, in Psalm 133, the psalmist writes this. He says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. How good, how pleasant it is when the people of God live in unity together. Uh, it's like, that's such a nice thing, and it doesn't happen very often. And James notes here in this letter or this book, he, he, noticed, he, he notes several different kinds of disagreements of, among believers. Uh, in, in chapter 2, he talks about class wars, the rich and the poor. Uh, James also talks about employment wars, the employee and the employer in chapter 5. Uh, James addresses church wars or church fights in chapter 1 and in chapter 3. He talks about personal wars in chapter 4 beginning in verse 11. So he's talking about all of these conflicts that we have with other people. And these disagreements, they provide sparks and those sparks ignite those conflicts among us. And these conflicts, as they escalate, can, can truly um, mimic open warfare. If you've ever been involved in any of those kinds of conflicts and wars. And, and before Jesus left, in, in, in fact, it was, it was as he was um, getting ready to go to the cross, as he was walking with his disciples, and they were about to be arrested, some of them, Jesus in particular, about to be arrested and, and, and brought in and taken up on charges and, and, and arrested and whipped and crucified. Jesus prays. And in John chapter 17, we have this prayer that, that Jesus is praying. And, and before he left, he was, he was praying for the unity of believers. His, his prayer goes like this. One part of it says, 
Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So as Jesus is walking and with his disciples and he's, and he's thinking about what's going to happen and what's going to take place, Jesus pauses in his prayer and he says to the Father, he says, I'm not just praying for these disciples here with me. I'm not just praying for these folks who are alive right now, but I'm praying for those individuals that these disciples will reach. And in other words, Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for you and for me. Now, I don't know who it was that, that brought you to the Lord. You know, that's kind of a, a funny statement because we know that, uh, that the Lord is the one who saves, right? The Lord is the one who gives us salvation. But we also know that our part is to bring people to the Lord. Our part is to share the gospel. Our part is to introduce people to Jesus as Andrew introduced others, introduced his brother to Jesus. And I don't know who it was that introduced you to Jesus. But if you took a look at that person, I don't know who it was that introduced them to Jesus. And I don't know who it was that introduced them to Jesus. But if you go back far enough, you go back to the disciples. Um, so every one of us who claim the name of Jesus, there's a long history behind it. And so, so Jesus is saying, I'm not just praying for these folks here, but I'm praying for these folks who are going to tell other folks, who are going to tell other folks, who are going to tell other folks who told us. And we responded. And he says, I'm praying for them, and, and this is my prayer, that they, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus is praying for the unity of believers. Jesus is saying that we all belong to the same family. He's saying that we all trust the same Savior. We are all indwelt by the same Holy Spirit. Why then do we fight with one another? So those conflicts that we have, we have with one another. They're war sometimes. And then James goes, out, goes next to point out a second war. And that's the war that we have within ourselves. He talks about that in verses, the end of verse 1 and verse 2 and 3. And, and, and what he says is that, that selfishness is the root of our inner conflict. Selfishness that leads to greed. That, that leads to want, to desire of what others have. And it leads us to go to war against them. But it begins with not them. It begins, James says, with our own sinful, covetous hearts. In Isaiah 53, the prophet said this of God's people. He said, we have turned everyone to their own way. We have turned everyone to, to, to think about and to put themselves first. Me first. My way, my way is the best way, my way is the only way, my way is the right way, this doesn't suit me, that doesn't suit me, I don't like this, I don't like that, uh, you should do it my way, you should do it this way. Selfishness where it all begins, this, this conflict that we have. And in fact, in verse 2, James says that our selfish desires lead to wrong actions, that we don't do the right thing. In fact, he says, the reason why you don't have what you want is because you don't pray and ask God for it. And then when you do pray and ask God for it, you're asking for the wrong thing. Um, our sin selfish desires lead to wrong actions, and it even leads to wrong praying. Lord, I, this is what I'm praying for, and we're praying. I'm praying for this and, and that, and it's, it's just a selfish thing to, to make me more comfortable. And when we are focused only on ourselves, we can see nothing. Uh, we can see no one 
clearly and conflict ensues because we're thinking about what we want and our desires. We're looking at things from our perspective and we don't take the perspective of the other individual into our consideration and so there's a conflict. Um, but, we, but it begins with ourselves. Ourself. So, so, so we have conflict with others uh, and, and we think it's their fault, but James says, no, look a little bit closer. And he tells us that it's, that it's within us. That's the cause of our conflict. And we say, well, okay, maybe I can do better. Maybe I can do better. Maybe I can take a course. Maybe I can learn some, uh, uh, some, some keys. Maybe I can learn some principles. I can learn some truths. Maybe I can mentor someone. And I can do all of these things. And, and therefore, I can get rid of that conflict. And we can all live at peace and have rainbows and unicorns for the rest of our life and just in this, this la-la land, this fairyland that we, that we want to create for ourselves. But then, but then James takes it a step further. And, and he says, well, you know, really you're at conflict with others. Or you're at conflict with yourself. But, but, but here's the source. Here's the initial source. It's because... We are all at conflict. We are all at war with God. Verses 4 through 10. That the root cause of every war or every rebellion, uh, conflict, is our rebellion against God. The cause of every war or every conflict is our rebellion against God. You can write that down. That's the truth. We pray for peace. We pray for no more war. Folks, the only way that's going to come about is when everybody gets right with God. And, and you know, that's not going to happen. <laughs> not anytime soon. So there's going to be war. As long as there is sin in this world, there are going to be wars. As long as there is sin in this world, there's going to be conflict. And it's because we are in conflict with God. And you say, well, how is that? How, how, how is that possible? We become at war, we become at war with God or in conflict with God by becoming friendly with God's enemies. Look at verse 4. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity or hostility against God? You see, we want to all just get along. We want to all just live this, this, this good life and just get along with everyone. And so we become friendly with the flesh. And then we become friendly with the devil and then we don't resist the devil as it says in verses 6 and 7 and our entire mindset turns against God it's a it's like a little uh, slippery slope that we go down and instead of resisting the devil we we become friendly with the devil and and there's no end to our conflict because our selfish and sinful hearts continue to rebel against God and we choose our own path because we have turned each one to their own way and it all eventually leads to destruction. So there you have it. The reality is that we are at war with others and we are at war with ourselves and we are also at war with God. And you're saying to yourself, okay, what do I do? Because my life is in turmoil. And I understand what you're saying. There is war going on in my head. There's war going on in my life. There's war going on in my work. There's war going on at my home. There's war going on in society. And I just have, I just feel in turmoil all the time. What's, what, what are you trying to say? Where are we going with this? How can I enjoy peace instead of conflict? In verses 7 through 10, we see the formula. We see the antidote. But we can't apply the antidote and we can't follow the formula until we first know the cause. So what I've just outlined is the cause. Our conflict basically, with God. And therefore, James is able to say in verse 7, 
Submit yourselves to God. You want to live in peace? You want to have that burden lifted? You want to feel, you, you, you want to feel um, at ease in the midst of this world, in the midst of all that's going on in your life? Submit yourselves to God. And what that is, is, is a voluntary act of, of placing yourself under the authority of God. And, and, and that's what happens when we really pray and really mean, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. You see, the only way that happens is when we submit ourselves to the authority of God. And, and submit, to submit means more than just being passive, just, just complying, uh, just sitting back, just sitting down and say, okay, God, whatever you want. You ever get that way? You ever get that way in a, in a relationship or, or someplace at work or at home or, or, or you, okay, <laughs> whatever. Just, just, just do it and I'm just going to sit here, and I'm just going to go with the flow. That's not what submitting to God is all about. It's not passiveness. It's, it's signing up. It's signing up. It's putting our name on the dotted line. It's, put, it's signing up for service. It's a pledge of allegiance to the Lord. It's, it's unconditional surrender to a, a greater cause, a greater sovereign, so that we can fight under his banner. To submit yourselves to God is not to throw up your hands and sit down, but to submit yourselves to God is to follow God and, and to be a part of what God is doing and be a part of what God's, God's work is to fight under the banner of the Lord. Um, you know, we sing those kinds of songs. You know, onward Christian soldiers and, and, and we get up and, and we march and we go forward. Secondly, the second part of that, that antidote is, is to resist the devil, the scripture says here, and he will flee from you. It's the other side of the same coin. We submit to God by resisting the devil. And we resist the devil by submitting to God. It goes together. Satan constantly leads, seeks to lead us to live lives that are self-centered. When we become more concerned about what's going on in our life and, and, and how people are looking at us and how they are treating us, he constantly seeks to lead us into self-centered and world-centered activities and attitudes. Uh, he wants to water down our allegiance to God. Uh, we submit ourselves to the Lord. We pledge allegiance to the Lord. And, and we get ready to fight the battle onward, Christian soldier. And Satan would have us to water that down a little bit. Don't get carried away. Uh, take it easy. Uh, you deserve, uh, at, at this stage in your life, you deserve um, to be able to sit back. Let those other people take care of it. Let those other people do it. He waters down our allegiance to the Lord. We have won the victory, no doubt. We know how it ends. We know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. We know, we know what happens, but we need to actively oppose the enemy of God if we want to know peace in this life. Indecision, doubt makes Satan bold. Indecision and doubt makes Satan aggressive in his attacks. But he flees like a coward when we confront him with a, resol a resolute will and a firm confidence in God. You know why some of us are in such turmoil today and we're throwing up our hands and we don't know and we wonder where God is and why God doesn't listen and why this doesn't? It's because we're double-minded. We, we, we kind of like wave in the wind. We're, we're kind of like the sea that is tossed to and fro. Uh, it doesn't mean we're not a Christian, but it means that we've lost that, that confidence and that assurance 
and that resolution that we once had and that allegiance that we had to the things of the Lord. And so Satan envelops us and seeks to bring us down. Thirdly, third part of this antidote is to humble yourself before the Lord. When we are genuinely humbled, when we're submitted to the Lord, the promise of Scripture is that God will lift us up. I'm reminded of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son, familiar with that? Those of you who are familiar with the, with the parable of the, of the prodigal son found in Luke chapter 15, um, the youngest son decides he's going to leave. He's going to take the inheritance, money that doesn't even belong to him, uh, he's going to take it and, and he wants it all and he's going to spend it on, and, and I think the scripture talks about riotous living. I don't know what riotous living is, but that's what he spent it on. And he had all these friends and he had all of these, um, all of these opportunities, had all of these things. And he kept spending his money, spending it and spending it and spending it, kind of like the state of Illinois, spending it and spending it and However, unlike the state of Illinois, he woke up one morning and he found himself eating the food that the pigs wouldn't eat. Now, I don't know much about pigs. My grandfather had pigs when I was a kid. And what I remembered about pigs was that they ate everything. Don't throw it away, the pigs will eat it. This young man was eating the food that the pigs wouldn't eat. And so he came to himself and he said, my goodness, I am no longer worthy to be called a son of my father. He said, I'm no longer worthy to even be a servant of my father. But I do know this, that if I get up and I go to him, at least he would hire me as a, as, as a hired hand. That's the lowest of low. That's, that's the very bottom. And so, and so he gets up, right? He gets up. He picks himself up and he heads towards home. And all the, I don't know how long it was from where he was to where his dad was. But I do know this, that as he was walking, he was rehearsing in his mind over and over and over again what he was going to say to his dad. Dad, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm not worthy enough to be a servant. Just, just take me on as a hired hand, if you would, so I can have something to eat and a little bit of, uh, of something over my head. And the scripture says that, 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 in my paraphrase, the scripture says that when, when the boy was, was far off in the distance, when he was a speck on the landscape, that the dad, who was sitting in his rocking chair on the front porch, looking out for his son as he had done every single day since his son had left, when he saw that, that speck, and he wasn't even sure it was his son, that the man got, the father got so excited that he jumped up and he ran out to him. And it kind of makes me wonder how many times did the father run at some speck on the landscape and find out that it wasn't his son. But on this day, it was his son and he ran up to him and his son saw his dad and as they got close and as the son was, was going over in his mind over and over what he was going to say he starts to say, he said, dad I'm not worthy to be called your son, I, I am not worthy to be a servant and his father doesn't even let him get the words out and he says, he says quick, quick bring this, bring this son of mine a robe Get, a, get, get some sandals to put on his feet, get a ring to put on his finger, and go and fill the fatted calf, for this my son who was lost has now been found. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. If we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will lift us up and give us cause to celebrate. My prayer this morning on this weekend that we celebrate our freedom and our independence. My prayer today is that we might know personal freedom and spiritual freedom. I pray that we might have the assurance 
of our salvation. I pray this morning that in a world that is filled with wars and a tense and troubled peace, that we might know real peace. I pray that we might know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And that also we may know the power of the Holy Spirit to provide calm in the midst of the storms of life. And I pray this morning that we may no longer live for self, but that we may indeed live for Jesus. Will you pray that prayer with me this morning? Let's bow our heads together and let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I do pray this morning that we might know real freedom, personal freedom, spiritual freedom that's, that's separated from the freedom that we have as a nation. I pray, Lord, that everyone this morning might have the assurance and the confidence of, of their salvation. I pray, Father, that we might know real peace in the midst of a very troubled world. I pray that we may know Jesus as our Lord and Savior and that, that having him as our Savior, that we too might know the power of the Holy Spirit, that he might provide calm in the midst of the storms of life. And oh Lord, there are so many storms today. Father, I pray that we may no longer live for ourselves, but that this morning we might make that commitment that we would indeed live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.